This Week in Radio Tech, episode 246, is brought to you by Lavo and the new Crystal Clear Virtual Radio Console. Crystal Clear is the radio console with a multi-touch touchscreen interface. By the Telos HX1 and HX2 telephone hybrids, the most advanced hybrids ever developed for use with analog phone lines. And by the new Axia Fusion AOIP mixing console, packed with features and capabilities refined from over a decade's worth of IP audio experience. Hey, what's today's broadcast engineer's most important tool? An oscilloscope, volt ohm meter, infrared thermometer, maybe diagnostic software? John Bissett says your most important tool is one you probably already own. Chris Tobin and Kirk Harnack are talking with the workbench wizard, John Bissett, on Twerks. Hey, welcome into This Week in Radio Tech. It's the show where we talk about everything in radio, you know, from engineering-wise. From the, you know, we don't care what records you play. We just want to make it sound good. Everything from the microphone to the light bulb at the top of the tower. This is the show where we talk about it. Engineering, uh, audio, RF, um, ticks, tips and tricks. And that's going to be a good subject for today. Uh, I'm Kirk Harnack, founder of the show. Been doing the show for, uh, gee, almost, almost five. It's been almost five years. I think so. It's, it's time flies. And we've talked about a whole lot of subjects. Uh, one of our co-hosts is with us right here. It's Chris Tobin, the best dressed engineer in radio. Well, maybe not today. From Manhattan, New York. Hey, Chris. Well, it's still a sporty outfit. It may not be a button-down shirt, but it's a sporty outfit. It's, it's, How you doing? How's how's the weather in uh, New York City, Manhattan? Uh, actually, it's a balmy 38 degrees right now, and the the flurries have subsided. And now I'm told, watching the weather forecast, we're going to get down into the teens tonight. Actually, I think single digits. So it's. Uh, and then the report was tomorrow debilitating cold temperatures. Ooh, debilitating. <laughs> debilitating. Yes. Holy cow. That's terrible. You know, it's warmer there than it is here. It's like uh, something like 30 degrees here in, in Nashville right now. It's, it's, it's chilly and going to get a little colder. No, no <laughs> snow, though. But speaking of snow, I was talking with our guest, uh, John Bissett. Let's go ahead and bring him in. Uh, John Bissett is our guest. Hey, John, welcome in. Thank you very much. Good to be here. Uh, a lot of you may know John from his workbench column in Radio World magazine. Uh, John is the editor of that column. He puts together uh, in every episode, every episode, every every column, every edition. He puts together two, three, four, five uh, tips and ideas, things that are really, truly helpful for your studio and transmitter sites. John, how long have you been doing that column in Radio World? You know, Kirk, I was thinking about that. It was the early '80s. I don't know the exact date, but uh, somewhere along '82, '83. So it's been a long time. A lot of tips. Wow. You know, the, uh, reading Radio World from cover to cover was one of the ways that I got educated on how to do engineering uh, back <laughs> in the early 80s when I started my sure. company in, in uh, 1984, I guess it was. I did okay. it and went out and did engineering full time and had to read that cover to cover. And I, so I know I read plenty of your tips and tricks. So thank you so much for educating me back then and now. You know, you know Kirk, that's one of the things that's kind of neat about doing the column. Uh, you you write it, but you never know who's going to read it, how it's going to help people. And I can't tell you the hundreds, probably thousands of people that have come up to me over the years at trade shows and places like that that uh, have said they've gotten something out of the column. And uh, do you remember such and such a tip? And uh, uh, that really bailed me out or whatever. So uh, it, it's, a, it's a really neat work to do. And uh, uh, it, it's very rewarding to see the kind of uh, help that uh, – not only myself, but all of the other engineers that participate and, and send tips in uh, it, use this column to help one another. So it's really a, a great camaraderie. Uh, John, uh, we're going to get to our first commercial quickly here, but uh, first, <laughs> give me a quick weather report. You and I were talking before the show, and the snow is coming. What? I don't even know where you live. Is it up in the northeast somewhere? Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm up in uh, Manchester, uh, New Hampshire, Wow. And uh, the uh, snow is coming down pretty hard. Uh, we get these snow squalls once in a while, and uh, we definitely had one today. And we were just supposed to get a dusting. I think we've got about uh, three inches that are outside now. And uh, talk about temperatures, about seven degrees. Oh, oh <laughs> as, a, as a high. <laughs> oh, so, gee. Yeah, it, uh, it does get cold up here, that's for sure. Hey, weatherman, we've got three inches of dusting on the ground right now. <laughs> That's exactly right. Hey, our show, This Week in Radio Tech, is brought to you in part by the folks at Lavo. 
Lavo is a con console company. They make big consoles. You may know them for that. But they also make smaller radio consoles. And the one that I want to tell you about is this one called the Crystal Clear. It's what you might call a virtual radio mixing console. Now, the Crystal Clear is based on the same mixing engine that the Lavo Crystal uh, uh, mixer is based on. But instead of a hardware surface with, you know, faders and buttons, physical buttons that you push, they decided to, hey, let's try this. Let's put the surface in the form of an app. And we can make it beautiful. We can make it... Um, context sensitive so when you touch a button on the screen you get the options that only have to do with with what you're touching right then you know with a microphone or a codec now there's a video of Mike Dosh he is in charge of the virtual radio projects at uh, Lavo and he's demonstrating the Lavo Crystal Clear virtual radio mixing console uh, that this was done at last year's NAB show and he's uh, describing how this this context sensitive uh, arrangement um, the the uh, on-screen Console app gives you eight faders, plus, of course, uh, a fader for your speaker levels and a fader for your headphone levels. Uh, Real-time uh, uh, time of day clock and date, of course, on that. Countdown timer and stuff like that. Um, and, uh, you know, channel on-off controls. All the things that you'd have in a, a hardware console, but you get them in a piece of software that's running a mix engine uh, with audio I.O. that's over in, in a rack somewhere. In fact, there he's pointing to it right there. Um, it's, it's actually one rack unit. It's one of those units that's in the rack. That's where you bring your audio inputs and outputs to, this one rack unit box, mic inputs, line inputs, uh, AES inputs and outputs. Uh, it has dual redundant power supplies available, and it also speaks Ravenna, and uh, as a consequence, it can speak uh, AES67. So it's ready to go for audio over IP and compatible with uh, with anything else that is uh, claiming to be AES67 compatible. So you have a lot of options there for audio IO, very convenient installation, neat wiring, and um, hey, if you know if the PC that's running the console app, well if it ever dies, you just fire up another PC, put it on the network and tell it to control that mixing engine and you get uh, you know your broadcast, you get your your control back of your your broadcast station. Um, uh, of course, it has all the things you'd expect in a normal console, like Program 1, Program 2, uh, Preview or, or Q. Um, uh, it has uh, you know, headphone volume controls, headphone outputs. Um, uh, it has the ability to uh, save a scene and then recall that scene. So if your morning show is different than your midday show or your, your maybe your news talk hour, uh, then you can just recall the scene that sets up your faders just exactly how you want them. So that video that we were watching, um, you can go to the Lava website and watch that video. It's about eight minutes long, and Mike Dosh explains all about the Crystal Clear Virtual Radio Mixing Console. This is interesting to you. Uh, go ahead and do it. Uh, it's Lavo. That's L-A-W-O. It's a German name. L-A-W-O dot com. And then look for the uh, radio consoles and look for the Crystal Clear. And right on that page for the Crystal Clear Radio Console, you'll find a link to that video uh, where you can get the complete demonstration. Check it out if you would. Pretty cool idea. And, uh, you know, now that it's AOIP compatible with, you know, uh, the rest of the world that is uh, AES67 compliant. All right. Thanks to Lavo for sponsoring uh, this week in Radio Tech. All right. Chris Tobin is with us. And, Chris, you and I are going to listen a bit while, uh, uh, while John Bissett uh, you know, gives us some ideas and tips and tricks. And, you know, I got a feeling that John's going to ask us some questions, too. So we got we to gotta pay attention <laughs> to the show. Fair enough. John, John you wanted to start out. Uh, I think with uh, a subject of the most useful tool or tools to have, and, and you and I talked about this before the show, and I gave you a couple ideas, and well, I my answers <laughs> weren't fitting you what you what you wanted to hear. So why don't yeah, you? Your, your answers were somewhat dated, uh, like like mine. yeah, <laughs> like me, like me. Exactly, well, exactly. My like most useful tool is a my most useful tool is a butt set. <laughs> you know? There you go. That's not what you had in mind, though. So, to, to talk so, to us about the about the one tool you, you need to have. Well, there there's several of them, uh, Kirk. But I'll tell you yeah. what. Before I get into that, I want to give Chris equal time. Uh, Chris, the top of your mind, what would you say is the uh, the, the most useful tool that uh, uh, you've uh, had as a broadcast engineer? Well, it was uh, either my Simpson 260 meter or my newest Fluke uh, DVM is one of them. Okay, very good. And Simpson 260 was one that I had listed down here. 
But, but one that I think is uh, even more important than that is a cell phone with a camera on it. Stop and think about this. How many times have you been into a piece of equipment trying to identify something and uh, you know, you're either not able to get your head in there to see yourself what it is, or you contact uh, customer service and they tell you that, hey, uh, uh, you know, do you have a camera? Can you take a picture of this thing and email it to me so I can see what it is that you're looking at? So um, cell phone cameras are really useful. Kirk, you were telling me that uh, you took one up on top of a tower when you were doing some, some STL work. Sure, I live dangerously when I do tower work, which <laughs> I, I, I sure I carry my seven hundred dollar you know Samsung Galaxy Note phone up with me, and but it takes great pictures. So um, I was doing some tower work last summer, and my I wasn't ready to move my STL dishes over to the new tower yet. I was busy putting up uh, coax. And I didn't have the connectors yet, so I had to go back a couple days later and put the connectors on up the tower. Uh, it was just you know, a fault of opportunity that I had to do it in that order. Normally, you put the connectors on while you're on the ground conveniently sure. and then pull the coax up, but I couldn't do it that way. So uh, I took some pictures of the coax just to help remind myself um, which one was which. Uh, I, I had And I had pulled the coax up such that um, one of the coaxes uh, had the... The, the 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 labeling on the coax was in line with going up the tower and the other one was in line with coming back down the tower and i had to i had to uh, make a note as to you know which was which aha this is for going to that transmitter site and this one's going to that transmitter site but the taking a picture was very helpful also you i take a picture to help explain to my business partner why we need to spend some money on this or that oh and an, boy, I'm glad you mentioned the cell phone. Uh, I have a a uh, a blower in a tubed transmitter that is failing, and um, I I wanted to get a clear picture of the label on the motor so I could order a new motor. And I could have you know written everything down, but you know it's hanging upside down, it's backwards. Exactly. I would have to get a, a light. It was just a real pain. So I op turned the transmitter off, opened it up long enough to get the camera in there, make sure the flash is working, take a couple of pictures so the flash wouldn't glare too badly, and I could read all the data on the manufacturer's label. And, it, it was, oh, even better, uh, it, I guess whether you're using an iOS phone or an Android phone, you can sign up to have that, you know, go to the cloud right away. So, you know, even if I lost the phone or, you know, otherwise deleted the picture or whatever, uh, for me, it's it's you know it's it's up in the uh, in the Google world of uh, online storage up in the cloud. Now that's very good, Kirk. You br bring up a real good point. Uh, I'd like to to suggest for engineers, by all means, take pictures when you're out at the transmitter site. A lot of GMs don't go out there; they don't even know where the transmitter site is. You see things that they do not see, and the, if if you want an idea of. Uh, uh, the level of support and, um, I guess, just uh, uh, respect that you will earn. Let them see a snake. Let them see a six-foot snake skin. <laughs> let them see, yeah, right. Uh, let them take a look at the uh, squirrel that uh, caught, got caught in the transmitter and fried inside there. Um, let them see the flames coming out of the top of a transmitter when you uh, uh, hit the thing and you've got a, a, a short. Um, these kind of things that, uh, that, that they're able to see will give them a better picture of what your world is all about, that you're not just going out to the transmitter site to goof off or take a nap, uh, that um, you know, there's some serious things out there. Uh, and along with that, whenever I've done work uh, as a contract engineer many years ago, uh, I always took either a, the program director or the general manager or the owner with me. Uh, believe me, when you turn the power on to a uh, uh, Collins power rock and that 15 kilovolt supply is shorted and the <laughs> flames shoot out of the top of it, yeah. you, you know, somebody's got to change their pants. And uh, it's usually the general manager. They have no idea uh, what you're going through. And uh, letting them see some of these things uh, really does uh, help as far as the... Uh, the respect that you need, and, and like you say, if you need a piece of equipment or if something is broken, let them see exactly what's the matter, and uh, uh, the camera phone does a good job of that. Wow. I, I w while you were describing that, um, you know, photographs uh, are, are 
great and we need to use them. But when you have something that's intermittent like that, maybe you take a little movie because if you got a phone that takes pictures, it probably takes a movie. And sure. uh, I was thinking of, hey, let's say that you know you're an engineer and you're not familiar with how a transmitter might normally uh, be behaving or with the the misbehavior that it's showing. Take a movie of of the the meters wiggling the wrong way or you know what happens when you turn this control or that control and send that movie to the support department that you're talking to or maybe a trusted engineering friend your your Elmer if you will somebody who's teaching you about engineering and sometimes just by the characteristic of oh I see that you know the plate voltage meter is uh, is ticking downward sometime well that indicates you know a poor connection uh, that that you know that maybe or maybe there's some arcing uh, that, that's going on maybe the the, the power is uh, is ticking backward or maybe the reflected power is ticking upward uh, with audio or maybe not synchronous with audio these are all clues and if you you don't exactly know what that means take a little movie of that happening and sometimes the the way that something is behaving in real time is a real clue to what's wrong it's an excellent uh, excellent point and uh, I, I think having having that and not being afraid to share it with other engineers we're not supposed to know everything I, I know we would like to but uh, you know the reality of it is is there's uh, no way that we can know everything uh, with regard to radio engineering. So that's where, as you said, the Elmer, your other uh, uh, engineering friends, folks at the SBE, or, or even field service. And uh, let me touch on that for a second. People don't like to use field service because they feel like it's uh, uh, a signal of defeat. I couldn't fix it, so I've got to, uh, uh, to go ahead and uh, uh, keep working at it. Uh, I made a kind of a rule of thumb that if I couldn't diagnose the problem and get it uh, uh, corrected within about 10 or 15 minutes, I was on the phone to the uh, field service people. And here's the reason why. When you buy a piece of equipment, a portion of that cost is uh, figured into uh, field service or, or customer service on the phone. So yeah. if you have a problem and you're not using it, you're throwing away that amount of money. So it's like, look, you've already paid for it, so you might as well get some use out of it. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah, that's that's very true. Uh, and in the, in the broadcast world, um, I, I you know, we in our industry, we do expect a certain amount of uh, customer service, support service by phone or by email. Uh, at, at no extra charge. In other industries, that's not the case. You're going to pay for everything, every contact with the company. But in, in broadcast, uh, part of that is is built in. Chris Tobin, what are your thoughts uh, at, at, at this point? I love the camera idea. I can just remember to do it more often. Um, <laughs> there you go. Be better off. Yeah, I, I've been doing the camera thing for a long time. I've got uh, several hard drives full of pictures of sites and things I've done. <laughs> the, the cell phone now just makes it easier. But I would definitely say that's on the list of things to you know to make use of. I agree with John. You know, I, I have no problem calling service uh, the service desk. Um, a lot of times, I mean, I look at it as, hey, they do this for a living. They built it. They designed it. They have access to stuff I don't have access to. I was just working on a um, high-powered UHF transmitter about about a month ago and working with two guys. And, you know, we got everything working pretty much where it's supposed to. The book was pretty clear. I mean, could have been better, but it wasn't. And then all of a sudden we realized something else was amiss because we couldn't get the excited to stay on. The transmitter would come up, all the amplifiers would come up, and everything would make full power, and all of a sudden, it would burp. So we called the uh, manufacturer and explained to him what we did, followed the instructions. First thing out of his mouth, he goes, which version of the service manual do you have? And we're like, uh, the one that was shipped with the box? Okay, what number? We give him. He goes, mm, yeah. Okay, that, t that, uh, that calibration alignment procedure you did? Yeah, that doesn't work. What? So... <laughs> <laughs> so that was the oh, that was the first conversation or the first call to the service desk to say, hey, we're not sure why this works for a while and stops. And we discover that the book we have is no longer valid because during the time, I guess, of the manufacturer shipping everything else, changes were made, but the books yeah. weren't kept up to date. So uh, I would and, suggest if you take over a site or you're at a site, um, contact the manufacturer now while the boxes are working normally and make sure you have the most current documentation for it. That's very good. And, and Chris, something else, double check and see uh, what kind of updates the factory has provided. Uh, right. As uh, something is out in the field and operating, they're going to find that there may be a better way of doing it. And uh, they'll, they'll have a service update that uh, you can go ahead and install, which may have some bearing on future problems that uh, you're looking to get solved. 
Oh, oh yeah. Uh, well, I, I worked. I, I worked at a radio station. It was a ten kilowatt directional. It was a continental transmitter, Doherty uh, oscillator design. And I had a problem. I couldn't figure out why I couldn't get it to work right. I'm going through the book, the manual. I'm like, something doesn't add up. Contact, you know, uh, Continental. Explain to the guy what I'm trying to do. And he says, what do you have, the 10 kilowatt? Yeah, g- give me the serial number. So I go and look at the serial number. It says serial number 100. Zero, zero. Okay. And, and I'm, like, <laughs> I'm like, oh, no. Oh, I know where, I know where this conversation's going. Well, <laughs> that was, you know, as it says, 100 off the, the production line. The, uh, the exciter stage has been changed considerably. A lot of changes they found, discovered, and made to the box, and updates had not been done to the unit over the life of its uh, existence. However, as Continental has always been in the past, they were good enough to send me the information and some parts and said, do this, do this, and this, and you should be in good shape, and you shouldn't have any issues with that modulation, nor should you be getting a call from the FCC about your um, very wide-band uh, carrier across the dial. <laughs> <laughs> I, was like, I was like, okay, but the guy I talked to, he was... Not retiring yet, but he was coming close. He said to me, he goes, oh, yeah, I remember those transmitters, the first generation. They were good boxes, but they were kind of, uh, they were kind of broad, a little more than we thought they should be. <laughs> I was like, all right, at least I got him. But uh, it was well go. worth the call. <laughs> hey, hey, John. And Chris, that's um, a good point. Uh, let me mention real quick. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you're talking about the service folks. Sometimes when you're talking to them, you won't even get the whole problem out of your mouth before they'll tell you it's change uh, R57. And the point that Chris makes that they built this stuff, they designed it, and they're servicing it every day, they know what's going to go wrong. So when you call them up and tell them that I, I'm getting this overload light or I'm getting uh, this meter indication or this LED that was normally on is not on, they're going to tell you exactly what the problem is. And especially these days where it's not one engineer per station, it's one engineer per, per three or four or five stations or more. You know, it, it's, you don't have the luxury of sitting there all day long trying to figure it out. Your job is to get it fixed and get it fixed as quickly as possible. And if you need to help, have someone else help you diagnose it, it's just good engineering practice. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. I have a good story regarding that, but I think uh, Kirk has something. Uh, I think we have to do a commercial or what? No, well, well, we do in a minute, but what I want to say is that, um, you know, with we don't always think to to try to share information via a picture, you know, the, which is what we were talking about. Um, and so maybe it's if the service department, you know, if, if a picture will help uh, convey the information that needs to be conveyed or, or a little movie will, um, you might suggest to the service department, hey, I've got a picture of this thing misbehaving or I've got a movie of this thing misbehaving. Can I can I email it to you? And because the service department, they may not think to ask you for a photograph of how it looks. Um, and by the way, this also kind of has to do, I guess, with remote access too. A lot of our problems are things that we're looking at on our computer screen and things not behaving right. And so if we can make sure that we have some method of reasonably secure remote access that we can offer up to uh, to a support department or the support department can offer you, you know, like, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, go to support dot com uh, where they can you know look in, into, into your computer with your permission um, uh, over a uh, you know encrypted uh, uh, connection. Then this can be very helpful uh, as as well. John, you uh, you said there are several tools that should be our most important ones. And the cell phone, we had a great conversation about the camera and a cell phone. Uh, what else might be on your top list of uh, two, three, four, five different things to have? Got a couple of others, but first, since you're talking about pictures, you can always send them to Workbench. Uh, earn a little money for your uh, your submission. Uh, I'm always looking for that kind of uh, tip. Help other engineers, and uh, just simply uh, my email address will uh, will take them, and Kirk will provide that later on in the program. But oh uh, yeah, okay, what, yeah. One other thing that I think is just uh, invaluable for engineers is the Sharpie marker. You can do so many different things with a Sharpie that are going to help you out. Uh, and uh, let's start with marking things. Um, it's so important that you have uh, uh, your equipment labeled. Kirk, you were talking about coax, labeling coax with uh, mm-hmm. uh, a Sharpie. Uh, you can write right on the brass connectors. So you know exactly what uh, connector goes to uh, to which antenna. Um, marking coils inside an AM phaser or coupling network, uh, especially where the coil taps are, uh, those sometimes come loose and fall off. And rather than spend half the night trying to retune the uh, the network, 
Uh, if you have marked a Sharpie marker on either side of where the coil clip is uh, connected, you just take it and plug it right back in and you're back, back in business. So um, a Sharpie is another inexpensive but very useful tool. That's a great idea. That's a, and sometimes, uh, I, you know, people have different opinions about marking up equipment. Um, uh, and, you, of course, you can write things down. You can take a picture. A picture is probably better nowadays now that we have the cameras. But I'm maybe I don't always think of the camera. But on transmitters that you know, I have a habit of when the transmitter is operating <coughs> exactly right, I'll go put a little dot with a Sharpie marker on the meter itself, here's where this meter is supposed to live. This is where, when it's operating right, here's where the power goes, here's where the voltage and the current, and a couple of the multimeter things, like here's the filament and, and the you know the grid current or whatever. And I'll, and, you know, I won't mark it up with a big mark, but I'll put a little dot there. Now, nowadays, maybe better take a picture and then you know print the picture out and post it uh, on the transmitter. That, that could, could be better for you. But that's the way that I like to document things so that I can send somebody the transmitter site and have them look at, well, that's below the dot now, you know. Uh, what you mentioned, uh, John, about marking equipment is so crucial. I'm on the phone with uh, one of our guys at our stations in Mississippi, and I, I tell him, hey, go to the, uh, the Windows utility PC in the middle rack, and he'll have no, I mean, there's seven PCs in that rack, and he'll have no idea what mm. it is until, until we used a brother P-Touch and labeled it Windows labeled it, Utility. Absolutely. And, yeah. and I think that falls in line with the Sharpie marker is the brother P-Touch. Uh, you can use those things for uh, all kinds of labeling. And it not only helps you, but if you have someone coming in, say you get that vacation time and uh, uh, someone else is watching the place for you, having everything labeled will make things a lot smoother for that person to troubleshoot a problem. Um, one last thing with the camera phone. I don't want to beat this thing to death, but it just occurred to me uh, when we were talking about how many stations engineers are, are in charge of. I've talked to several directors of engineering who have maybe hundreds of stations under uh, their belt that they, they are responsible for. And they put together a photo gallery of each station, the transmitter site, the racks, the equipment in the studios. So if there's a problem and uh, it's hundreds of miles away, they can call this up on their computer and they can look and exactly uh, tell the engineer or the operations guy, okay, the third piece of equipment down, that's the one I want you to look at, tell me what it's doing. So, uh, you know, you don't have to keep all of this in your head. Uh, you've got uh, sort of a cheat sheet, if you will, of uh, folders with all of the pictures of everything at the station. I, I used to do pictures with, um, with remote kits. People used to laugh at me. But oh, that's would just a great mention, idea. I, I, I used to send out reporters and uh, news folks and sports with a you know, remote kit, simple stuff. I, I never sent them out with a bag of connectors. I just was not into that, the adapters and stuff. That's just not my thing. So I would take a picture of the complete kit, the way it should be set up, you know, put it on a nice tabletop, lay it all out connected. All the cables had numbers and markings so you know exactly what to do. And that way, um, if, if there was a panic mode phone call, whoever called in to the, the radio station engineering office all they had to do is say, do you have the book? Yes, good. Open it up. Look at the picture. Tell me that you have this, this, and this. What do you have? And if they couldn't find all the picture parts, then we knew somebody didn't properly pack. <laughs> and it, and it, saved, it, but it saved so much time. Because right away we knew exactly what they had, what they didn't have, and how to work around it while they were out in, this, at this, in the field. So the pictures do work really well. It just, you know, got to be smart about it. John, do you, do you sure. recall if, um, if uh, a station owner in Tennessee named Paul Tinkle has he ever been a contributor to uh, to your column workbench? Yeah, yes, he has. That name is familiar. He's uh, he, he he's one of the guys who preaches take a picture of the remote kit and you know, and this oh, is how the stuff goes in. Yeah, yeah that's he's, he's really good great. You know, I've hey, heard people mm -hmm. with the remote kits, uh, Kirk, uh, using suitcases uh, and uh, you know laying everything out inside the suitcase, so everything is organized. You're not grabbing out of cardboard boxes. And it looks a lot more professional for the radio station to the uh, in the eyes of the uh, of the client when you show up and open up the suitcase and pull things out uh, using the foam inserts to hold everything in place. Well, that's, that's the truth. true. That's it. That's true. So we have the uh, cell phone with the with a camera. We have the sharpie marker. <laughs> I wouldn't have thought of a sharpie marker, but you're so right. It makes your job easier. What else? What else might be important to carry along? And, uh, We've got the Brother P-Touch, and let me throw in a little commercial for the Sharpie marker. Telos has got uh, really nice 
fine-tipped Sharpies. We had them at the NAB last year. I'm pretty sure we're going to have them again this year. And uh, if if you get out to the NAB, come on by and we'll get you one. If not, uh, see the uh, Telos uh, uh, field rep in your area and uh, they'll get you squared away. The, the Sharpies that are fine-tipped are really the best ones to use because you can write real small and uh, it's that permanent marker thing. Um, Look, uh, if, mentioned- if, we, if, if they can take my camera for a second... There oh, it is, right go. there. Hey, yeah. absolutely. I, I, I last time I was in Cleveland, I, I, I broke into the prize closet. And, <laughs> yeah, got, got me one. Got, and these Very are great good. for you know writing notes on your hand. <laughs> Let's see, <laughs> uh, part numbers. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I do that. There I'm sorry, John. Go. go ahead. I just wanted to show no, that. I'm, yeah, I got one. No, I'm glad, glad you got one. Uh, it's interesting. Uh, Chris mentioned uh, Simpson VOM. Uh, volt ohm meters, uh, well, the digital volt meters are fine, but the problem is when you're measuring AC currents or AC voltages that there can be a back feed and it'll show you that there's something there when, when it really isn't. And that can be somewhat misleading. So uh, the analog version uh, of the Simpson volt meter uh, is an excellent tool to have. Uh, it, it's um, easy to use and it's very, very rugged. Uh, I would definitely say if you you don't have one, get online, take a look uh, and see the units that are uh, uh, out there. I'm sure that you can find some used units that uh, uh, will do just fine for you. They're great for I'm checking sure. transistors and diodes, too. Yeah. yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. It does. You know, the, the, the well, tough thing about a Simpson uh, volt ohmmeter is that you have to know how to use it. <laughs> well, that one's pretty easy to learn how to use, but uh, the others may not be. Uh, but, you know, you're talking about uh, uh, different things. I'm just thinking about this, Fluke is really a neat company with the, the products that they've come out with. They have a remote meter DVM. And what this is, is the guts of a, of a meter and the display pops off and communicates with the main unit with the uh, uh, you know, no actual wiring. So if you're inside a high voltage uh, device of some sort and you need to make a measurement, you hook this thing up, you pop the meter off, you close everything up, turn the transmitter on or the equipment on, and you get an indication without your hands being inside or without you having to uh, defeat interlocks to get inside there. Two other things that Fluke offers is I mentioned the volt pen. This is a pen. It looks kind of like uh, your Sharpie marker there, uh, Kirk, but it's got a, a clear end or, or a, uh, a translucent end. And whenever it comes near uh, AC, the, uh, the tip of it glows red. So where this is really useful is if you think that uh, there is no power into something and you run this little meter, uh, actually this pen around, and uh, the tip glows red, you know that you've got uh, voltage there and to watch out. So you're not going to get yourself zapped. Yeah, One handy. other thing, yeah, it really is. And uh, uh, in fact, it's funny, the, um, I think it was the Texas Association of Broadcasters a couple of years ago, they provided volt pens to every attendee of the TAB show. And I thought, wow, what a great idea to make sure that engineers aren't going to get uh, electrocuted. So very good uh, piece of equipment to have. And it's not very expensive. I think it's like around 20 bucks. I mean, your life uh, yeah. is worth more yeah. than that. So it's, uh, it's really worth it, worthwhile. Hey, you're watching This Week in Radio Tech, the show where we talk about radio technology. We're talking with John Bissett. Uh, um, uh, Chris Tobin is here with me, and, uh, and John Bissett has joined us. He's the uh, columnist who's been writing the Workbench column in Radio World Magazine for years and years and years now. And I thank John so much for providing plenty of tips that, that help teach me a lot of things about broadcast engineering uh, as I was growing up in, in the field. Coming up on the show, we're going to be talking about Satellite dish maintenance. This should be interesting. Uh, walking tour of Lowe's and Home Depot. Now, I think I know most everything about Lowe's and Home Depot, but I'll bet you John will, I'll bet you John will tell me some things I've, I've overlooked. Uh, plus uh, signal flow charts and how to get started in AOIP. All that coming up if we can buzz through it uh, as the show continues. Uh, this Week in Radio Tech is brought to you in part by the folks at Telos. And the Telos hybrids, so popular, uh, they ship, uh, the folks at Telos just ship Oh, um, literally hundreds of these every month. <laughs> They're very popular. This is the Telos HX1 and HX2 telephone hybrids. Now, these are, on the one hand, 
kind of good old fashioned telephone hybrids. You plug a POTS line into them or a POTS extension from your business phone system uh, or from an analog terminal adapter to convert SIP to POTS. Anyway, you plug a POTS line into uh, into this. There's a the HX1 has one uh, phone line and one hybrid. The HX2 will accommodate two phone lines and two hybrids. And the hybrids internally, I mean, hey, the connection may be old school, but the internal hybrid is really sophisticated. It's a Telos fifth generation hybrid. And that means everything that Telos has learned over the past 30 plus years about telephone hybrids and getting the best quality sound out of a phone call and sending audio to the caller in the most in the best possible way. Uh, that all that information, all that engineering has gone into these telephone hybrids. Now the HX1 and the HX2 are very international in scope. There's a dip switch setting inside that lets you set the hybrid, uh, the the phone line interface for the characteristics, uh, the official characteristics for. Uh, any country in the world. So if you're in France, you, you may have a certain loop current uh, and a certain uh, voltage and that you're looking for or a certain ring cadence you're looking for, you set it for France. If you're in Russia, if you're in Ukraine, if you're in India, if you're in Singapore, if you're in Canada um, or uh, Venezuela, you have, you have dip switch settings for these countries and that will help the hybrid, uh, help the, the phone inter interface uh, properly detect um, uh, when it's ringing, uh, help it go off hook properly and help it go back on hook properly so that it works no matter where you are. You plug it in and it works. Um, we have uh, a number of uh, uh, cool things in here like digital dynamic equalization. So the caller's audio is constantly uh, dynamically EQ'd, trying to get the best audio quality, bass, mids, and highs out of the phone caller. And this makes for better call-to-call -call consistency as well. Plus, there's audio processing in the HX1 and the HX2 from the folks at the Omnia division of the TELUS Alliance. So the call volume should be always consistent, call to call to call. Uh, there's an option for AES-EBU, inputs and outputs. So if you want to hook it up to your digital plant, you uh, buy the option for AES-EBU, inputs and outputs. Um, the internal... Um, the internal digital structure is uh, is uh, all 24-bit uh, uh, sampling with 20 dB of headroom and plus 4 dBU nominal levels. And all that means it's very professional audio. You're not going to run out of headroom in the digital section to get great audio into or out of it. Uh, by the way, you can buy the analog I.O. version, and if you later on, if you need to convert to the AES-EBU version, it's easy. Just uh, order the AES-EBU kit, open it up, and plug those uh, daughter boards in to give you AES-EBU. Uh, the quality of this thing is just amazing. You go into so many newsrooms around the country, around the world, actually. You go into podcasters' uh, production areas. Um, you go to reporters' desks. You go into radio stations where they don't have a multi-line phone system, but they might just have one or two lines to put on the air or in production. You're going to find the Telos HX1 and HX2. It's that popular. If you really want bang for the buck, look at the HX2. You get two hybrids and two lines for a really popular price. And the HX1 is not bad priced either. Uh, check them out if you would. Call your nearest dealer or go to the Telos webpage at uh, telosalliance.com. Click on the Telos label and then look for the uh, HX1 and the HX2 digital telephone hybrids. Awesome stuff. A lot of work has gone into making them sound terrific. I, I get pictures from studios sometimes uh, from around the country, around the world, and sure enough, there it is. The telephone, tele, uh, Telos hybrids at the HX1 and HX2 so many times. Um, all right, let's move on. Our guest is uh, John Bissett. Uh, Chris Tobin is here with us. Uh, Chris is in New York where it, uh, they've missed a snow again, I think. And uh, John Bissett is, is in, uh, is in uh, New Hampshire uh, where they're getting snow. So John, That's correct. Missed. You may be snowed in for tomorrow, huh? <laughs> you never know. That's one of the nice things about working out of your home, though. <laughs> you can't really use that as an excuse. Uh, yeah, Look, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> let me tell you about one other piece of uh, Fluke equipment that uh, it, you should consider. Uh, that's yeah. called a, a Fluke infrared thermometer. These things have come way down in price. They're like $30, $40 now. And uh, where these things are useful is in checking the temperature uh, inside an electrical box the uh, the temperature of the of the wires where they tie into the breakers, uh, you know, fires can start if uh, the uh, set screws are not tight. 
Uh, you can have problems like that inside phasers, inside transmitters. What you're able to do with this is just point it at uh, a specific component or whatever it is that you're looking at, and it'll tell you what the temperature is. So you were mentioning keeping records of things. One of the things that you can do is uh, take a, a record of your inside transmission line, for example, and uh, especially at the elbows where there may be a, a potential for a, a split bullet or, or a problem with a bullet failing and the uh, transmission line failing. Uh, look at the temperature there and keep a monitor on that every couple of months and see you know, what it's doing. Uh, going up the tower, measuring the uh, uh, temperature of the, especially the rigid line as it goes up the tower, uh, can tell you if you're going to have a problem there. Uh, these uh, infrared uh, thermometers, though, are uh, really a lifesaver. And the first time that you find a, a hot uh, uh, connection where the uh, plastic on the breaker is starting to melt because things have gotten too hot in there, uh, this thing is more than paid for itself because uh, being down, having the transmitter down or having equipment, sensitive equipment down because of uh, uh, overheating is something that uh, you know you, you just want to try to avoid at all costs so you don't have to have a problem with that. It just so happens I have one right here. Oh, wow, look at that. That's because oh, that's I, do, I, do, I do a monthly test uh, maintenance for a TV and FM station here in the city, and uh, I started measuring the temperature of the transmission lines, and they all looked at me like, why are you doing that? I said, first place is going to be a failure is when the resistance builds up. I'm going to find it before it burns the place. Chris, and that's so true. Like that's great. That's really good. I'm glad to see that you've got one and, and that it's been so useful for you. And again, there, there are a variety of prices, but uh, you don't need a real expensive one. But just to have one, uh, treat yourself to that and, uh, and help and let it help you diagnose problems around the station. Can you take your temperature with that when you're sick? You sure. probably can. <laughs> <laughs> I chased oh, the I dog around with it. I wish they had that around when I was a kid because my mom had the um, the thermometer that didn't go in your mouth. Yes, yes, ah, those <laughs> <Yeah>. days. <laughs> I think we all did. Hey, Kirk, let's yeah. let's take a tour, a walking tour around Home Depot and uh, and Lowe's. Uh, okay, you mentioned let's do it. that you know everything about those places, but I thought I did. Are, <laughs> well, you probably do, and what you don't know though is that they change stock quite regularly. So what they had, say, in the spring, they may not have in the winter. Uh, you can find all kinds of neat things. And one thing that I, I, I found that uh, is just really, really useful, especially talking about Chris's uh, remote gear, is um, these uh, pieces of Velcro that are on a roll that have the hooks on one side and the loops on the other. So you cut the piece of Velcro for as long as you need to loop around the cable bundle. And um, this is in the plant section. Uh, they use them for holding plants or seedlings up to, uh, uh, to a stake. And, um, you know, it's, it's one of these things where for five bucks, you've got, uh, oh, I don't know, maybe five, ten feet of uh, hook and loop Velcro uh, cabling ties that uh, yeah. you can customize for all of your stations. Cool. Okay. All right. So, so uh, uh, what else will we find at, at Lowe's and Home Depot that's that's going to be helpful? I like the five gallon orange buckets at the at the entrance to Home Depot. <laughs> They're good for carrying helpful. stuff around. And, yeah. <laughs> They're good for a lot of things. Uh, um, one of the other things that I like uh, are the, the uh, assortment of LED hats that they have, uh, where they have LEDs in the brim of the hat, uh, or or a uh, clamp on. Uh, uh, light that uh, goes around your head so that when you're in dark areas, you can see. And uh, these are all LED lights, so they're not burning out. And uh, uh, speaking of that, the, the LED trouble lights. You know, we've all had trouble lights where you, you drop it and the, the bulb burns out. Uh, getting uh, are, the LED are we, uh, ones. I, I think I may have a small example uh, right here. <laughs> Oh, yeah, let's see. Hey, there we there go. You go. You've been to yeah. a Lowe's or Home Depot. Yeah, and you know, if, if you get in trouble, you can uh, put the thing on, on red like that, see? I'm not, I'm not sure. Yeah. I guess you'd use the red in, what, a dark room? Or, oh, it, I, if you're piloting a plane and you don't want to ruin your, your night vision, you'll turn on the red and, there you and, go. and use that. Only problem is then you 
don't don't mark up your aviation maps with a red marker. Yeah, you, you won't do any good. <laughs> yeah, and really I, this and this thing is really handy. I forgot that I had it until you just mentioned you know, it. I'm impressed that you guys have these things. That's really great. Oh, they're well, gadgets, man. How, how can we not have them? That's what we do. <laughs> there you go. There you go. But, uh, you know, see, just, but it's, it's it's like your cell phone. you got to remember that you have it to take a picture. There you go. I, for, exactly. I for, totally forgot. I could have used that thing when I was fixing some vacuum cleaners a few weeks ago. <laughs> and I, you know, I'm trying to hold a flashlight and fix the vacuum cleaner. So, uh, that would have done the job right there. And I've seen the ones with the... The lights in the in the brim. I think my wife bought one uh, for her uh, for her, her stepdad for Christmas because it was just kind of cool. But that's a great idea. Yeah, and uh, when I say the walking tour, what you do is just go up and down each aisle, just kind of walking around and just see what they've got and think of you know different uses for some of the things that are there. Uh, oh, you'll wait, find, wait, no, uh, no, 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 no. You, you're, that, that's go so ahead. that's so wrong, man. My credit card can't handle that. <laughs> Are you kidding? I fill oh, up three good. baskets, <laughs> three shopping carts. Yeah, no, marks. that's true. That's very true. <laughs> no, yeah, no, no, very you good. can you can find some good stuff there. I did recently, well, last year I guess it was. I have in my uh, riggers bag when I'm climbing stuff. I have um, the come alongs and uh, oh, yeah. the nylon. It's a one inch wide web stri- you know, uh, strap. And recently, doing some work up on the Empire State Building, we had to la- lash down the ladder we were working on. And the guy's were like, oh, crud, we don't have enough rope. I'm like, no, 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 no. We're going to do it better. And I took out my three little, uh, you know, uh, come along. I said, here we go. Strapped it in, rock solid. That thing didn't move. The guys were like, this is unbelievable. Where'd you get those? I'm like, home people. <laughs> <laughs> here they are with these, you know, huge, huge ropes and, and everything else going, eh, they're not, not really tightened down. I said, no, this tightened down really nice. And it doesn't stretch, doesn't shift, it, it, it stays in place. It was, it was really good. Chris, that's a real good point, and uh, they are. They're really solid. There's another company that has stuff like this uh, on the web. It's called Harbor Freight. Uh, one of the yes. things that, uh, that they have that uh, I picked up when I was doing contract engineering was uh, a stamp kit that allows you to identify copper or identify uh, pieces of metal. They, these are little stamps that uh, have all the uh, numbers and, and the letters of the alphabet, and you just tap them with a hammer, and you can identify things that way. But uh, you'll find all kinds of great great tools in there. And the thing that's nice about Harbor Freight, I'm not sure where all the items come from, but uh, they, they're pretty well built and uh, they're inexpensive, which uh, with today's engineering budget is always a good thing. <laughs> all right. Uh, hey, I've got a question then. What can I find at Home Depot? Uh, let's say I'm taking apart, uh, well, I've got a project coming up. I've got a laptop across the room here. And I have to replace the CPU fan in it. And I'll tell you what, there's a video on YouTube that shows how to replace this fan. You have to, to take everything in the laptop out. To, the, the fan is the last thing. You can't get to it. Oh Just take everything else out. So my question is, um, what can I, what, what's the best thing to use as a little parts bin that I can put screws? And even better if it had uh, little sections to it. But what, what's a, what's, I, I lose screws here on the desk. They fall on the floor, and I know there's a better way, something I can put screws in. What do you think? I'd have enjoyed right, you, uh, you know, that works. Uh, a muffin tin is good. Uh, oh. And uh, if you've seen these uh, uh, multiple pill containers that uh, yep, they allows too. you to hold like uh, seven days' worth of pills, uh, yeah. dropping stuff okay. in there. Uh, the point is, is that what's nice with that, the muffin tin, you know, you can always upset that and the stuff goes flying. But with the uh, the pill containers, they have a little top that snaps shut. So, uh, you know, you've got it sealed until you need it. So the, these are my screws that I took out on Tuesday. And these are my screws okay. I took out on Wednesday. <laughs> gotcha. That's a, that's a great idea. Go. No, that's a, 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 the, okay. All right, good. Uh, and I'm, I think there's probably other flat... Um, you know, cases uh, that that you know have little con- compartments. That's a good idea. I'll I'll look for that before I begin my project to take the laptop apart. Very good. All right. Hey, are are there any um, chemicals or cleaning solutions that uh, are indispensable nowadays? Seems like I remember we used to use some cleaning solutions that you can't buy anymore. I forget what they are. <laughs> I forget what we call them. But there's stuff that you just you can't find anymore. What's good nowadays for cleaning things? Getting dust well, and grime off of motors and parts and stuff like that. What you're referring to is cramelin, which is uh, available if you go over to Europe. 
Uh, I understand that uh, Germany, especially, there's not a problem buying it over there. Uh, but as far as distributing it here in the United States, going to have a hard time finding that. Uh, the company Keg, C A I G, and mm -hmm. you can Google them. Uh, they have a new product called Deoxit, which does yeah. a good job of lubricating. It doesn't work as well as Cramelin, but uh, it, it's it's a good good device or a good uh, uh, lubricant and cleaner. So uh, it will con it clean the contacts for you. Um. Okay, uh, I guess I, I was thinking of a of a uh, more volatile uh, spray that we used to use. Seems like you could buy it from Lauderdale Electronic Labs. Hmm? With tetrachloride yeah. stuff. Maybe that was it. Yeah. yeah well, was that could that. be it. Yeah, that was popular. That was used. For, it smelled like um, you know, like paint thinner, but it was it was more volatile than that. <laughs> I'm one of these guys. I like the smell of paint thinner, so it never bothered me. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I know what you're talking about. There was a couple of them that we all used to use, uh, keep at the transmitter site or in the studio shops. Yeah. <laughs> now, <laughs> I, I guess everybody everybody knows this, but when I was doing full time contract engineering, and I still have every one of them. Um, I would bring all kinds of parts popular parts with me to radio stations and I had uh, a tool specialized tools even things to lap heads with you know to refinish the heads we don't do that much anymore but I had all that and I used fishing tackle boxes to put all this stuff in and I would yep. I would label the boxes to you know what you know hey this is all parts and this is all RF connectors and this is all audio connectors so fishing tackle boxes were very helpful uh, in, in my engineering career I still and, have two know, of mine <laughs> and I was going to say, you'll find them, uh, again, at Home Depot or Lowe's. What's nice is, is if you're ever uh, around a hospital with uh, EMT guys, you'll see that the EMTs use these same plastic bins to store all their bandages and syringes and everything. So they're uh, very, very useful. And uh, Plano, P-L-A-N-O dot com, mm -hmm. is uh, one of the companies that uh, has probably yeah. the widest variety so I uh, see about getting something like that because you're right. It's nice to have everything organized uh, so you know where it is. <laughs> well, actually, the more organized you do it, the better you are tr troubleshooting because you have less time tr you're looking for your stuff. Oh, yeah. there you go. Yeah. I, I wondered why you were laughing. Yeah, I, in fact, the, that uh, Plano, Plano, whichever you pronounce it, that, that's exactly what several of my boxes are. So uh, they've been oh, okay. terrific. Good. I've, had them, I've had them for – oh, I've uh, – Struggle to think. I've had them for tw almost thirty years now. <laughs> I have I have two of the planos as well. Mine are orange and white, so people think I'm a you know a medic or something every time they see me. <laughs> hey, there you go. <laughs> That's great. Clear but I purposely way. did that so they would stand out when I'm at a transmitter site or a, a you know a, a multi use a multi um uh, facility where there's multiple uh, uh, stations. This way, my box I can look across the room. And go up. Oh, there's my box, <laughs> and I can go grab it. Odds that somebody have the same one. One topic you wanted to talk about was satellite dish maintenance. Now, look, uh, I mean, maybe I'm being simplistic here, but you keep the snow off the dish. Isn't that about all there is to it? Or did you have well, something more in mind? It, it, there are a couple of things here, Kirk, that uh, I think would be useful for uh, uh, viewers to to consider. The, the dish being cleared is certainly one. And with the snow going on outside, it's something that uh, I know people in the Northeast are concerned about. Uh, one of the things that you need for that is what we call a roof rake. And you can't find them in Walmart or Lowe's or uh, uh, Home Depot. They've just all been sold out. There is a company called MillerFence.com. And uh, those folks are in Worcester, Massachusetts. And they are making those things like nobody's business. Uh, the <clears throat> Let's see, the 10-foot one is uh, $60. And uh, I'm sorry, the uh, the five-foot one uh, is $50 and the 10-foot one is 70, I believe. But uh, these things will allow you, they've got a long uh, handle. It'll allow you to get uh, up into the dish and uh, pull the snow out so that you're not scraping the dish and you're not uh, deforming the dish, which is one of the concerns. Um, I've seen engineers go behind the dishes, especially the mesh ones, and just yeah, start yeah. Be be beating them with their hand. And when oh. they're done... They've got all of these lumps in the dish, and they can't uh, figure out why uh, you know, they, they're not oh, getting they're signal down. anymore. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Oh. Now, oh, no. the other thing with these uh, is to mark the bolts with the Sharpie marker. So if somebody decides to come and tamper with the dish, turn screws, turn uh, uh, the, the bolts or something, 
you know where the bolt was so you can get at least close to where the alignment was. And then finally, for tuning in the, the final alignment, uh, this is a tip that will, I think it's going to be in the, uh, uh, the second February issue of Workbench. Uh, this engineer took the cable coming off of the LMB and cut it and mounted it on a feed through that he mounted on the back of the dish. What this allows him to do now is to break that point and actually plug in to see what's going on so he's not crawling up on the uh, back of the, uh, of the dish on a ladder, balancing the, uh, uh, the, the receiver, trying to uh, uh. tune everything in that way. So you can do it down on the ground, and uh, when you're done, you just reconnect the uh, uh, the feed through, and you're all set. The feed through is a great idea. I hadn't thought about that. I, I tend to, uh, I, I I always make about a um, oh a, a ten or fifteen foot jumper, depending on the size of the dish that goes between the L and B and just the back side of the dish, and I coil it up a couple times, put an F connector uh -huh. on it. And then I bring the cable, you know, that's going to the building or down into the conduit and bring that up and coil it up a couple times and hook them together with an F barrel connector. That way, behind the dish, I've got coiled up cable and I can disconnect it there to, to, to like you said, bring a receiver outside so I can, you know, do some tweaking up or aiming uh, of the satellite dish while I'm right, right out there. And it's much more convenient than any other way. Boy, I think I did it the hard way a couple of times to, to screw this. This is for the birds. Oh, I'm going <laughs> to, I'm going to make my cable point in the back. Uh, and now in a, if you're in a tough neighborhood, like some of my dishes are, you, you, you got to, uh, you know, cable tie this stuff up and put it up out of sight, out of mind, out of easy reach. Uh, but exactly. if you get it down, the, there's your connection. But the, the feed through is a great idea. I always, you know, come down the leg and then like go over the edge of the dish. Um, and right. uh, much, much smarter if I just drill a hole, put a like, it's just a Radio Shack, you know, wall feed through or some kind of little, little bulkhead feed through right there and poke that uh, RG6 cable through it. I think they're like 239 uh, at, uh, on the sites on the web. So very inexpensive, yeah. but it'll save you a lot of time. Really will. Great, great. Hey, speaking of time, we're almost out of it. We're going to come back and have one more tip, one more trick, but we'll just have a minute or two to, uh, to do that. Our show is brought to you in part by the Axia Fusion console. It's now shipping, and it is amazing. Uh, I'm, we're, going to, we're going to see if we have a little video to play right here for it. If we don't, I'll tell you about it. If we do, let's, uh, let's roll the video. Hi, I'm Clark Novak from Axia Audio. And I'm here to introduce you to the new Fusion AOIP Mixing Console, the newest modular AOIP console from Axia, the company that invented AOIP for broadcast in 2003. Let's take a quick look at some of the unique features found only in Fusion. After 10 years and more than 5,000 consoles, people constantly tell us how attractive Axia consoles are. But a console isn't designed for show, it's made to work in challenging conditions 24 hours a day, year after year. So here's a look at some of the special design choices Axia has made to ensure that Fusion meets that challenge. Some companies cover their console work surfaces with paint, which can rub off, or with plastic, which can tear or be ripped. Not Fusion. Its work surface is all metal, solid aluminum. Not only that, its double anodized markings are sealed in. They can't ever rub, peel, or flake off, which means the Fusion will still look as good in five years as it does the day you begin using it. At one time or another, we've all had the task of replacing light bulbs and console switches. Fusion does away with all that. All switches are lit with LEDs made to keep on shining for hundreds of thousands of hours. Oh, and those switches themselves are aircraft grade, specially sourced and tested by us to sustain millions of on-off operations without failure. So you won't ever have to worry about replacing those either. Fusion's frame is made from thick machined aluminum too. It's RF proof but also lightweight. No worries about whether your tabletops can hold up. Fusion's designed for drop-in installation and it's very low profile. No giant tub to intrude on under counter space. Where other consoles use dot matrix readouts for channel displays, Fusion comes with easy to read, super high resolution OLEDs above each fader. They show the assigned source, tallies when talkback or other special features are enabled, and full-time confidence meters to help prevent dead air. Talent doesn't have to wonder whether that caller is dropped or satellite feeds ready to join. 
airplane, they can see it clearly before they pull the fader up. No wipers to wear out on our rotary encoders, they're all optical. Some of the most important parts of any console are the faders. One of the reasons faders fail is from dirt, grime, and of course liquid that falls through the slots in the modules. Fusion's faders are special, premium, conductive plastic faders that actuate from the side, not the top. That way, dirt that falls through the surface slots falls past the faders, not into them. They stay smooth and silky nearly forever. That's a fast look at how Fusion consoles are designed to last and built to perform just as beautifully as they look. We'll see you next time. Thanks, Clark. That's Clark Novak with uh, the folks at Axia describing the Fusion console. You can check out, there's a total of four videos where Clark uh, is talking about different design aspects, different workflow aspects of the new Fusion AOIP console from Axia. You can check it out on the web at axiaaudio.com or go to, go to the main site if you want to. That's uh, uh, that's at uh, telosalliance.com and look for Axia and the Fusion console. Shipping now, it's gorgeous. And uh, hey, we just had a whole bunch of, uh, of dealers uh, of the Fusion console come into uh, Cleveland, did a big training uh, seminar with them. And so hopefully we'll be able to, um, uh, they'll be able to answer your questions. And, and uh, if you want, ask the folks at Axia about, about the Fusion console. All right, let's uh, wrap the show up here. John Bissett, you have uh, a closing tip or trick for us. I do. Uh, you know, this, and it falls right in line with uh, the Fusion console. AOIP is really kind of growing and growing and growing. A lot of folks say, how in the world do I get started with this? I may not need to replace my studios. Here's, uh, t here are two ideas. First off, using a Axia X node, which allows you to put analog into one end and then connect the other end with uh, an Ethernet cable. You can make an audio snake, so you can have four audios in, four audios out, uh, going from one location to another. Uh, inexpensive and simple way of uh, connecting up for, uh, uh, for AOIP and getting you started. And then later, when you install your AOIP studios, those uh, uh, X nodes can certainly be used for that. Uh, Kirk, we've got another product that uh, has really been very popular over the years. It was called Profiler. And the new product is called iProfiler. And uh, what this allows you to do is uh, basically air check everything coming into the station uh, or, or going out of the station, as well as uh, air checking your uh, competition, if you like. Using an iProfiler uh, software with a computer and with a uh, uh, Axia mixed node, which gives you GPIO uh, as well as audio in and out, you're able to connect all of this stuff together and uh, very simply uh, start uh, recording your uh, station uh, uh, station breaks or either skim it or, or keep your, a full-time logging uh, of your audio and also look at the audio of your competition. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. again, it's something that um, it's not real expensive to do, but it'll get you started. And, again, the, uh, the nodes that you're buying are things that you will eventually be using. It will never really go out of style. Awesome. And it's a great building block to have. Um, uh, and our sponsor, uh, Axia, would, would be delighted if you'd uh, get that. But, yeah, the, the, the Axia X node can do a lot of this. In fact, the very first use of, a, of an AOIP node, uh, John Bissett, was uh, as, a, as a snake between a studio building and a transmitter building separated by a parking lot. And uh, as you might imagine, at the transmitter building, there was a tower, which was a big lightning attractor. And so the multi-conductor cables under the parking lot, well, whatever gear was hooked up at both ends of that kept getting blown up. So they, they pulled a piece of fiber under the parking lot and just used a little fiber converter to convert Ethernet to fiber and fiber to Ethernet and hooked up uh, some Axia nodes at either end of that. That was, I think, 12 years ago. And it's still amazing. Just fine. That's great. Well, hey, Chris, with, with, regard, yeah, go ahead. Uh, with regard to the iProfiler, uh, I have a schematic drawing of how to hook all of this up. If uh, yeah. our viewers would like a copy of it, please contact me. And uh, real simple email address, J-O-H-N, the letter P-B-I-S-S-E-T, at gmail.com. And there you can see it on the screen. Uh, and just ask for the uh, iProfiler uh, schematic drawing, and we'll get a copy of that out to you. You can take a look at it. We'll, uh, we'll put that email in the show notes, and uh, folks can uh, jot that down. John P. Bissett 
at gmail.com. Uh, that, that is the same email address that's mentioned in your workbench columns in Radio World. That's right. So uh, if you want to submit something to John, a picture of something interesting at your transmitter site, some advice on uh, how to handle a problem, then you can uh, just send it to John Bissett at that address, johnpbissett at gmail.com. Hey, Chris Tobin, any uh, parting words for us? we got to go soon. No, no. Um, just if you're going to be troubleshooting and doing work, just uh, keep your tools handy and organized, and you should be in good shape. And don't be afraid to call for a supportive service because those folks do it for a living and you don't. So it, it's helpful. <laughs> it's a good thing. Very yeah. good. It's okay to ask directions. That's right. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Tough for us Especially guys. If you do a 50 kilowatt transmitter and you hit the wrong button, that, that could yeah. be. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I, uh, I've seen it here. happen. <laughs> yes. Well, I got more education about electronics from the uh, support folks at ITC3M, at Harris, and at uh, Continental um, back in the day. That's, well, that's where I got a lot of my education. So tell me again how this uh, solenoid circuit works. Yeah, uh, trust me, I, I had the same experiences. Yes, exactly. And the Collins Continental folks, that was what I was getting at earlier, was I called them up for, I took over a station. Uh, the, the method that the engineer before me used to keep the plate breaker on was a broom handle propped up against the breaker. And the reason for that was because they said uh, during certain storms or power conditions uh, during the summer, the, the transmitter would trip, you know, the breaker would trip. I was like, oh, that's odd. And usually if a breaker trips, it means it's an overcurrent condition. So maybe your currents are too high. No, no, everything is fine. It's, it's exactly how it's always been. I'm like, really? I got there. The plate current was about 200 milliamps. No, I'm sorry, an amp and a half over what the tube spec is. The plate uh. volts were hovering around 5,500 volts when the tube was supposed to be at 3,500. Uh. So I'm like, okay, there's a problem here. And I looked through <laughs> the books, the old logs, and sure enough, it's been this way for a long time. And I said, this doesn't make any sense. So I called Continental. I said, look, I got a Rockwell Collins, 3 kilowatt FM. A 310Z yeah. was the exciter at the time. And the guy goes, oh, yeah. that's a classic. He goes, <laughs> I said, yes, it is a classic, but it's my primary right now. So the, the, the uh, Collins V1 is the FM 1 kilowatt backup. So I got to keep this alive. And he said, I told him exactly what happened, what I, what I experienced. He goes, oh, I know what the problem is. Your transformer is tapped incorrectly for the plate voltage. It's real simple. I was like, really? But there's no other taps on the transformer. He goes, no, yes, there are. Did you look at the transformer and notice there were two th screws that did not label? There's no markings? I said, yes, that's what you want to use. I'm like, oh, I didn't see that. I didn't see that part of the manual. Sorry. That's the stealth mode, I guess. He goes, no, no, no. He goes, he goes go in the back and tell me you have the, the bleeder resistors on the right-hand side of the cabinet. And at, just below them, you'll see two little resistors. And there's a, a relay box, right? I was like, yeah. And to the left of that is a huge plate transformer, right? Yeah. And there are five posts for power, but only three of them are labeled and probably tapped. Yeah. You want to tap the fifth one because your voltage is above. Because, because we built those transformers because in the Midwest, the voltages vary considerably. So we used to have to change it for folks and tell them, just tap it all the way out and you'll be fine. You'll be back in range. I'm like, are you kidding me? He goes, no, no, trust me. I used to build them. I, are you talking to the guy who used to build these? I'm like, you still work? There? He goes, no, I'm retired. The guys at Continental <laughs> called me up and said they'd give you a call because they couldn't figure out the problem you had. Oh, I learned so man. much from that one conversation that years <laughs> over the years as I went to places that had the same transmitter the first thing i would look at is the taps on the transformer and i kid you not yeah. i tapped that yeah. transformer the way he explained it and all the voltages currents came right in line never had to use that broom handle again for breaker control but i did use it to sweep the floor occasionally <laughs> that's great chris one it, of the things that's kind of neat about that is uh those guys could have made a fortune if they had sat down and put all of those things to paper, all of those tips to paper. Oh, yes. uh, there were a couple of guys, uh, Ken Branton and uh, J. Fred Riley. Uh, J. Fred Cotton Riley. Oh, my That's God. Yes. One. And those guys knew everything. And it just uh, amazed me, uh, uh, the, the wealth of knowledge. And I think we all had the opportunity to talk to them. We walked away knowing something that we didn't know before we called. And guys, Dave on that Fred. note, we 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 gotta we gotta wrap it up. We are flat out of time. I want to thank John Bissett for being here, being our guest on this week in Radio Tech. Uh, be sure you look at Radio World Magazine and uh, and look for the workbench uh, column uh, in Radio World and get the latest tips and tricks and ideas and uh, things from the field that uh, that John edits and puts together. John, thank you for being with us from snowy New Hampshire. My pleasure. I hope we can do it again soon. I would love to. And and Chris Tobin from non-snowy but cold Manhattan, New York City. <laughs> yes. Thank you for being here as well. I appreciate you very much. Anytime, anytime. And if folks want to get hold of you uh, for some uh, consulting, 
they would uh, send an email to. They can send an email just simply to support at ipcodex.com, and we'll take All it right. from there. Uh, you do IP Codex, but other things too. Yes, actually, I have yeah. been. <laughs> you saw the pictures last week, the TV antenna yeah. work I've been doing. There you go. There you go. And thanks a lot to uh, Suncast and to uh, Andrew Zarian, producers of the show this week in Radio Tech, and our sponsors as well, Lavo and the Crystal Clear Console, the touchscreen interface console, and the Telos HX1 and HX2 telephone hybrids, and then also the Axia Fusion AOIP audio console. Check them all out. Watch for the show notes. Tell your friends, please, about This Week in Radio Tech. Uh, they'll like you, and they'll b appreciate you for telling them and reminding them about it. And subscribe if you want to at our website, thisweekinradiotech.com. We'll see you next week on This Week in Radio Tech. Bye-bye, everybody.